Uh, so my name is John Mayer. I'm on the faculty here at the University of Pittsburgh in the Department of Family Medicine. And um, one of my jobs is working with the Clinical and Translational Science Institute as co-director of their innovation core. So, um, you know, the technologies and things that are coming out of this conference for three years now? Where's Bruce? Is this the third or the fourth year? Fourth, fourth year. Uh, are kind of an exciting part of new tools that are uh, coming out of the research world and hopefully making it into patients. That's really the focus of a lot of our work at uh, CTSI. So, um, I don't have any more to say as introduction than that. So what I'm going to do is one by one invite our panel speakers up. Uh, they've got some slides here. Uh, they've been asked to kind of keep it to 15 minutes. If you're getting close to that, I'll ask you to stop just so we have more time to discuss. Uh, each panelist will give kind of a 15 minute talk about their work, have a seat, and then once they're there, um, I can moderate some questions to them that I hope will come from you. So as the folks are talking, please think about things you'd like to ask them. So. Um, I'll just introduce the people by name and position because that's what I've got here. Uh, Ellen Beckjord, <laughs> an old friend now, uh, the first winner of Pinch ever actually, um, is the Director of Population Health and Program Design and Engagement Optimization at the UPMC Health Plan. So Ellen, come on up and uh, you're going to talk to us about the use of chatbots in a mobile intervention for health behavior change. Good morning everyone. Thank you John for the introduction. Very pleased to be here to talk about the use of chatbots in a mobile application for health behavior change that we've developed at UPMC Health Plan. I'll do some acknowledgments at the end, but I do want to begin by saying this is the result of about two and a half years of work um, in that it has involved a lot of collaboration and a very interdisciplinary team, many of whom are here today. So um, it's really been probably the most rewarding team-based work of my career, and I'm very happy to be able to talk about an aspect of it with you all today. So I'll go through the next 15 minutes giving a little bit of an argument for why chatbots are a useful methodology to consider uh, in mobile applications talk about how they should be used and how we might collectively think um, intentionally about this as we try to build best practices around the use of chatbots and tell you about a rubric that we developed at the health plan to guide our use of this tool, give you some specific examples from within Odyssey, which is our mobile application for health behavior change, and end with a brief discussion, um, it may be really more for when we have discussion after all three talks, about the degree to which artificial intelligence is a necessary component of uh, chatbots. I think I probably don't have to mention this, but I can't start a talk on a mobile application for health behavior change without at least referencing, I also love this infographic from the World Health Organization, the burden of non-communicable diseases, both uh, in the United States and around the world. And so really at the root of these non-communicable diseases that are uh, inflicting an enormous amount of morbidity and mortality on our population are health behaviors, tobacco use, alcohol use, substance use, obesity, sedentary behavior, unhealthy diet. And so our efforts to change health behavior and to develop innovative and effective interventions around these health behaviors is, is certainly critical. And, um, and we've been excited to build solutions for those behaviors at the health plan. So why chatbots? Why consider using chatbots as part of your uh, digital intervention, in this case for health behavior change, but really for health? And so the first reason I think why is because texting. So chatbots simulate the activity of texting, and texting is a near ubiquitous and highly preferred communication method now for, uh, for most American adults. So for those of us between the ages of 18 and 45, we on average send and receive about 85 texts per day. 81% of Americans use text messaging every day, almost 100% of smartphone owners use text messaging. And there's a very high open rate for text messages, so almost 100% are opened and nearly half get a response. And it's such a normative behavior now that it really, and this is, this is uh, from uh, some statistics that I got from medium.com, that when we think about the enormous amount of information that has to be conveyed to a person uh, when they're attempting a health behavior change, Sherry referenced some of that, I'll talk a little bit more specifically about that in a minute, um, there's just so much education, so much intervention, that so much information that has to be conveyed that figuring out how to do that and package it within a behavior that people are 
engaging in very frequently on a daily basis um, can be a very powerful tool for conveying that information. It just kind of really slides right into what people are doing normally on a day-to-day -day basis. So because chatbots simulate texting, that makes it a powerful tool. Um, also, just want to mention briefly, if you're familiar with the National Cancer Institute's Health Information National Trend Survey, which is a national survey on a number of topics related to cancer prevention and control, but also on Americans' use of technology in the context of their health. This, these data are old, so the numbers are higher now, but in 2017, close to a third of Americans said they had used text messaging to communicate with a doctor or other healthcare professional. And so, you know, again, the use of text messaging in health is growing, and chatbots are a way to capitalize upon what is becoming a pretty normative behavior. But also chatbots because self-determination theory. So there are lots of different theories that guide our responsible development of digital interventions for health. We've used self-determination theory at UPMC Health Plan to help guide the development of Odyssey for a number of reasons, but I want to point out how chatbots in particular capitalize upon the main constructs contained within self-determination theory. And so if you're not familiar with self-determination theory, it's primarily a theory of intrinsic motivation which is an enormously important construct in behavior change and maintenance of behavior change. And self-determination theory is anchored in competence, autonomy, and relatedness. And here again, I think chatbots really capitalize on each of these constructs. So because people are using texting a lot, most of us, and chatbots simulate that experience, there's already a lot of competence sort of in that medium, right? We're not asking people to do something different than what they normally would do, in this case, to receive information about their health. Autonomy is preserved, choice is preserved, because there's, there's personalization of the chat. You'll see the way we've developed our chatbot in Odyssey, which is not the way all chatbots are developed, but you know, normally there's some ability to choose a response in the midst of the exchange in the context of the chatbot. So there's personalization and choice preservation. And, and I think that it's obviously a home run for relatedness. You know, we, make a, we make an important distinction between education and communication. So education I think of as a very transactional uh, exchange. You know, you're giving information to a person, providing them with education, but communication is a relational, a relational interaction. And chatbots are a way to deliver education, I think, in a relational context by really going back and forth in, in this uh, simulated communication. So it capitalizes upon relatedness, which is the third tenet of self-determination theory. So we've We've uh, enjoyed, and, and I have to take a step back and say, you know, developing Odyssey was really about a two-year process, and I don't think that we started um, developing the chatbot feature in, until about the midpoint, until about one year in, um, and then, you know, noticing how uh, it, it sort of gelled very well with our use of self-determination theory, again, was something that we got really excited about. But we had to think about how to use chatbots, and, and uh, this was especially, I'm a person who tends to, you know, when I get introduced to a new concept or a new idea or a new methodology and I'm excited about it, you know, I'm the classic sort of once you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? And so you don't want to overuse any particular methodology. Um, so we thought really carefully about how to use chatbots, and I'll, I'll walk through that uh, now. So, uh, but again, Odyssey is a, is a mobile um, application that is uh, a translation of evidence-based programs for health behavior change that were developed at UPMC Health Plan about 10 years ago. And like most payers, we have, um, we have programs that we are delivering through our health coaching capacity to help our membership either uh, quit smoking, lose weight, uh, improve their nutrition, increase their physical activity, or reduce their stress. And about two years ago, we embarked on a journey to translate what are uh, workbooks that contain that content into a mobile application that also functions as a just-in-time adaptive intervention. I won't be talking about that particular feature within Odyssey. Um, we did do this in close collaboration with a local company called Shell Games. Um, and again, it's just been a very rewarding interdisciplinary team um, project and a lot of good collaboration. So we had to take the, the content in these workbooks which again, through just the, the sort of static nature of that content, and Sherry talked about this in, in her presentation, how do you take a lot of content and uh, not just put a bunch of PDFs online, but how do you take that, that content that's kind of 
tracked, if you will, within a workbook that's very transactional, sort of intermittent, standardized. It sort of, you know, you can be responsive to the needs of people going through these programs who are using a health coach as they go through the workbook, sort of adding to what they're, translating it into the mobile environment, which really lets us be more relational, continuously available, proactive in our offers for help, personalize content more, even be predictive in the ways that we try to help people who are attempting health behavior change. And, uh, and how to do that uh, has, has, has been a very interesting process and chatbots have ended up being an important part of it. And there's a lot of content, so I know you can't read this, but, but this is a high level outline of just one of our programs, our nutrition program. So, you know, these notebooks are between 90 and 100 pages long. There's just a ton of content that has to get translated into the mobile environment. And, you know, and then up building upon that actual interactive experiences, et cetera. But again, it's, it, I think we, we can't sort of circumvent the um, challenge that adequately supporting people to change their health behavior involves conveying a pretty large amount of information. And, uh, and how to do that effectively uh, it was one of our challenges. And so we ended up really translating that content into, um, into four forms, chatbots being one of them. So we have these animated character chats, and I'll talk more specifically about those, but I just wanna point out that we also have other ways that we've translated that content to um, deliver to users of Odyssey. So we have some, some quick tips that often involve a little game or interactive experience. We have long form content, which is simply just you know written as, as engagingly as possible, sort of long form content about a particular topic. And then we have these adaptive interventions that involve a combination of real-time data collection using an ecological momentary assessment protocol and then delivery of a real-time intervention um, at, at the point of need, if you will. But when we were doing the translation of content into Odyssey, a place where we often found ourselves needing to make a decision was between uh, the use of a character chat or long form, right? Because both are good vehicles for delivering kind of a bolus of information. Um, and we, we were oftentimes sort of trying to decide between the two. And here is, um, here is the rubric that we, that we used uh, for doing so. And this is subjective. You know, I can't, I can't uh, tell you that we, um, that we made these decisions necessarily in the right way. I think some of what we'll learn as we continue to deploy Odyssey is uh, whether this rubric was useful or not. And I'm sharing it simply in the spirit of trying to build the evidence base around best practices here with all of you who may be facing similar decisions in the development of your own tools. But there are two pieces of content from our nutrition program, healthy eating basics and reading nutrition level, li labels. And uh, we went through this rubric for, for both of those, which were pretty significant pieces of content in the program and landed uh, with the decision to talk about healthy eating basics through a chat and to talk about reading nutrition labels through long form. And here are the, some of the things that we, we thought about when we were making that decision. So, so if content met at least four of the criteria here in the top box, which landed us with chat, um, we, would, we would use a chat bot to deliver that content. And so some of those considerations were, does this content really have potential to be part of a rich story or to give a lot of examples? Um, is it content that's gonna be easier to deliver in sort of small bites, even over a small period of time? Is there a way that interaction can be used in real time to test understanding of the content? Can the information be served up sort of in bullet point style? We had some structural considerations, so again, to sort of not overutilize any one methodology for delivering information. If this content showed up in a, in a module within the app that already had uh, two other chats in it, we, we wouldn't wanna use chat again. Um, we t thought about whether the relational nature of the chat bot could be used to sort of validate feelings um, or behaviors associated with the content. And if it was something that we felt like was especially appropriate for delivering in sort of a casual kind of harmonizing way. So if, if, a, if, if content sort of met four or more of those characteristics, it really kind of tipped us towards delivering it via chat. And for something like reading nutrition labels, again, if, if content met one or more of these, um, uh, pieces of information, it pushed us towards delivering it via long form content. So should the information be permanently skimmable? Meaning, is this the kind of information that a person going through this program might wanna return to again and again to kind of find something in there that they wanted to remember to sort of skim again? Because once the chats occurred, you know, they, they aren't accessible again within the app. 
Um, is it, is it more important to deliver all of the content at once? Is this something that in fact shouldn't be broken apart? Is there not really a good argument for using stories or examples? And are there so many potential reactions to the content that it would be difficult to anticipate what they would be, meaning it would be really hard to sort of program the response options in the chat uh, such that we thought it was safer to uh, keep the content in long form? So this was our, this was our rubric that we developed for making decisions about translating content into chat form or long form. And we uh, worked uh, at Shell Games with a, a program that you know, really kind of built these chats where we, we got the information into sort of, we knew what we wanted the character uh, within the app to say, and then we'd think about two to four responses that a person could pick, and then there's a personalized response to what the user says, and then the content converges again, and I'll show you how that works. Um, in Odyssey with, uh, with our smoking cessation program. So there are three characters in Odyssey that users chat with. Again, thinking about the relational notion of chats, um, they can, they can, people can, our users can chat with different types of characters. And so the first character is a health coach that users meet pretty early on who guides them through a lot of the programmatic content. We also have a veteran character in Odyssey which is a character that a user encounters uh, pretty early in their journey who represents a person who's farther along in the program than they are and can offer some guidance and normalize some experiences for the user. And finally, once you're about halfway through the program, you begin to have the opportunity to chat with the character we call a newcomer, who's someone that's earlier in the program experience than you are, and then that lets the user provide some coaching and support to a newcomer character. And again, just to, to I'm gonna show you a chat between a coach and a user, but um, by, by thinking, it's not just the chatbot methodology, but thinking about who's on either end of the chat, really helps, I think, to kind of blow up this relational notion and figure out how to really leverage that in the context of delivering a, a behavior change intervention. And so these three characters all play very different roles within the, within the app, but they really help to, um, to get some content across. I see John walking towards me. How am I doing? What have I got? How fast do I have to, am I full on auctioneer mode now or am I like, do I have five minutes? Uh, well, about a minute or two. Oh, okay, so, all right, can I get? <laughs> okay, well, I'll be, I'll be quick. So here's a health coach chat. I know it's probably hard to see, but this is the, this is the coach uh, asking the user, how ready right now are you to quit smoking? And the user's able to give one of three examples. I'm not ready, I'm still trying to figure it out, um, or I feel ready. And again, so these, these three screens that follow show if the user said, I feel ready, the coach says, that's great to hear. If the user says, I'm still trying to figure that out, the coach says, well, I can help with that. And if the user says, I'm not ready, the coach says, that's understandable, there's plenty to cover before actually quitting. But after that first response from the coach, the chat converges back immediately to the content that's being delivered. These are examples of veteran and newcomer chats, again, where there's this personalization and then convergence. And so I'll end with, and I'm still not convinced I drew this figure correctly. I was really struggling with this little cartoon for some reason last night, but, but maybe we can talk about it with the rest of the panel. You know, I'm, I haven't seen the data. If anyone has, I'd love to see it. About, you know, is per, so I think of AI as kind of being the high end of personalization or tailoring, right? So there's like content that's not tailored at all, all the way to content like where I'm free texting and I'm getting a response that's totally tailored to me via AI. And I'm, I, I haven't seen the data to suggest that there's a linear relationship between impact and tailoring, right? This chatbot doesn't use AI. It uses, I'd say, like a kind of mild to moderate level of tailoring. And we know that tailoring gives us a big boost in impact. We know tailoring matters. But I'm not convinced that there isn't a plateau, right? Or do you really get more bang for your buck as you tailor and tailor and tailor? And so, because the resource investment is dramatically different, right? There's definitely a linear, if not an exponential relationship between resource and tailoring. So I just wanna end by uh, thanking you for the opportunity to, to talk about this here today, to acknowledge the large team that has been a part of this, the health plan. Many of here who are here today and can, can talk as much or even better than I can about the solution if you're interested in it. And um, thanks very much for your attention. Thanks very much. Okay, and just to keep going here, we're gonna have our next speaker, who is Jeff uh, Bingham. Uh, and Jeff is uh, an associate professor of human computer interaction, or at the Human Computer Interaction Institute at CMU, and is going to talk to us today about robust conversational assistance from the top down 
I think. <laughs> so I'll do the same thing. Wander up quietly. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. So my name is Jeff Bigham. As mentioned, I'm from the Human Computer Interaction Institute and the Language Technologies Institute at School of Computer Science. I'm currently on leave at Apple, where I'm starting an accessibility and machine learning group. Um, and so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, chatbots, but uh, from a little bit of a different perspective. And so um, a few years ago, we were looking at what kinds of chatbots. At the time, we were mostly thinking about dialogue systems, which was slightly different. But we were talking about um, these dialogue systems and looking at how kind of brittle they were, right? So the fact that you know if you didn't respond in just the right way to the chatbots at the time, they didn't work, right? And so we started thinking, well, maybe instead of trying to build up from the bottom with only automated approaches, what if we started from the top down in that we would start with a system that was powered by humans that we would re recruit on demand from the web to power our chatbot, and then maybe eventually we'd get around to figuring out how we might automate some of that work away. Um, and so I'm going to tell you about that today. I think I wanted to start, though, um, it was a great, a great uh, ending to the, the last talk. Um, AI, right? So uh, I want to talk about AI very briefly in the broad strokes in that I think there's this idea sometimes that AI is magical. Um, AI is not magical. Um, in fact, AI is humans. AI is built by humans, sometimes large teams of humans. AI is trained often, so it learns from the data, often from humans, almost always in the cases that we care about, from humans. I mean, it's ultimately used and it's decided whether it's useful or not by humans. And so AI is built on the back of humans, right? Um, and this comes out in a lot of really interesting ways. In the case of chatbots or conversational assistants or dialogue systems, whatever you want to call them, um, here's one way that I think is really interesting and it kind of motivates some of the work that we did in having people power our, our, uh, our conversational assistant. So I went into my local library, this is the Squirrel Hill Library, and I found a book, and it, it's a book called Talking to Siri, right? This super intelligent conversational assistant of the future, I have to have a book to tell me how to talk to it. It's a little bit different than people, right? When I talk to people, I usually don't think that I'm going to have to read a book before I know what I can say to those people that it will actually know how to understand. And I, as I like to joke, this book, at the time of, uh, that I took this picture, this book was about this thick, you know? If I was to go back to the library and they had actually created another version of this book and the, the library had bought it, that book probably isn't that thick anymore. It's probably like that thick, you know? And why is it that thick? Well, it's that thick because over the intervening years, in this case, Apple has been working really hard with huge teams de dedicated to improving the coverage of what Siri can understand and how it can usefully respond. But still, most people wouldn't actually try just talking to Siri because it wouldn't work, right? It wouldn't work in unexpected ways um, in anything you might want to talk about. And it's not just Siri. All of, the, all of the assistants out there are basically the same. So every Friday afternoon, I don't know why Friday afternoon, I get an email from Amazon and it tells me about a new thing that I can tell, that I can talk to my Alexa about. So just another way of getting at this idea that uh, current dialogue systems are not able to just talk with us, right? So current dialogue systems are able to respond to and understand a limited number of commands. And so um, anyway, so we decided we we're going to take a different approach. And so I want to show you a dialogue that we had with Chorus, which is just, I'll tell you about how it works in a second, but it's uh, essentially people powered. All right, so here's. This was uh, a student of mine who developed it, Kenneth Wong. He was going to a conference where he presented work about this. Um, and this is the conversation he had. So he says, hi. Cora says, hey, I'll be able to help you in a few minutes. So it's off recruiting people. I should mention, I guess the timestamps aren't always here, but there's about a minute or so lag. So it's basically texting speed. So to the point of people want to text anyway, right? Um, so he says, I'm at the CHI 2018 conference. I'll have a free day or two. What should I do? And then it kind of leads him through this discussion of what he might want to do. Um, so he never really has to say where that is, so you can just Google that. So behind the scenes workers are probably Googling information about this. So bringing in all that context that would be great if we didn't have to explicitly tell our uh, conversational assistants. So he, they go through a discussion, you don't want to go to a movie, no, how about the, a garden or something. Um, 
they kind of talk about this for a while. Oh, wow. More stuff related. Do I really want to go outside? Is it going to rain? So kind of going from one topic to another, building up that and leveraging that context that you need to figure out um, you know, how to respond, right? So um, you know, will it rain is not a fully specified query if you don't already know where, where you are. Um, anyway, so the conversation ends. So how does this work? So it works um, behind the scenes. We have a group of workers that we've recruited from a, an online platform called Amazon Mechanical Turk, run by that same Amazon who uh, delivers everything to you, owns Whole Foods, owns the crowd marketplaces, apparently. Um, and they propose responses when they, get, uh, when they get a message from a user. Workers in the crowd also vote those responses through, so they choose which are the best ones. Um, and they also take notes. So one really important part about conversation is that you build this context. And so we're recruiting these workers who come to work on our service and then they leave, potentially. And so we want to maintain that context. Just as if you were talking to you know, a human person, um, we want to maintain things that we, remember, that we learn about the, the user. Uh, and so this is sort of the interface. We build it on top of Google Hangouts because it turns out there's really nice clients for pretty much every platform. Um, and you know, this, is our, this is our goal, right? We start here at the top, start to mix in some AI where it makes sense. So we're those really regularized, um, more straightforward tasks, maybe just helping the crowd workers. And then eventually, you know, maybe we'll get to the fully automated systems that everyone's trying to build. Um, we have started to automate this. So uh, you know, our piece right here where we have the crowd workers proposing responses and voting responses through is now just a kind of tiny part of this. Um, and instead what we have is, um, uh, oh, I guess I have an interactive walkthrough, sorry. Um, user interface, this is how it works. Okay, I do have a video. It's kind of fun to watch the, um, the workers responding to things. So this is the workers, they're getting points. There's all this stuff going on behind the scenes. How do we motivate people to provide good responses? Um, that sort of thing. Um, right, and so now we're working toward automating it. Right now we have at Chorus just kind of this, it's all people powered. Different ways we can think about how we might add in automation. So one way that's pretty obvious is if we do have all of these bots that other people are developing, maybe we can start to incorporate them. Maybe we can add them in uh, as crowd workers. So instead of just having people being able to propose responses, now we have uh, dialogue systems that are out there uh, proposing responses. Uh, maybe as we have conversations, so we have released this, so you can go to talkingtothecrowd.org, you can play around with it. Um, maybe we can use those conversations that we have recorded other people having to uh, respond to new situations. And so we have this information retrieval based bot that uses that corpus as a potential source of answers. Um, and then we have uh, automatic voting. So has anyone heard of Microsoft uh, Tay? Yeah, anyone? Anyway, all right, well, a couple people. So not too many people. Anyway, look it up. It's really an amazing example of how you can't just do this sort of thing, learning from the crowd without kind of human guidance because uh, it turns out inter people on the internet, who knew, people on the internet can be terrible. And so um, <laughs> they released this uh, bot that was supposed to learn from people talking to it on Twitter and the whole thing uh, basically devolved into uh, the Microsoft bot being this hateful, terrible internet person. Anyway, so we have automatic voting, but we don't just rely on automatic voting. We very carefully blend automated support for crowd workers to vote so that uh, they, uh, they have to do less work. So if we're really confident that it's probably a good answer, maybe we don't need as many votes from other crowd workers to approve a, a, a response. Um, I have some more things about like how this works. So how do we actually choose from our huge corpus of bots? Um, basically, we're looking at, given the message that the user sends, how similar is that to things that we've observed the bot be able to answer well in the past? So some stuff about that. Some more stuff about that. Got to have equations. <laughs> um, right, and so we, ought, we, we released this we, for several months. We had a few people use it. Um, and you know, we didn't, we didn't automate it all all of the interactions of Chorus, because that's not the goal, right? We wanted to keep the quality up. And so we found that we could reduce the human effort by about 12 or 13%, which in turn reduced the cost of each message, because we are paying these workers, by about 32%. And that 
it still retains the same quality, which is really important to us, and I think is uh, you know, a good goal going forward for us. Um, all right, so quick summary. Uh, chatbots and just AI in general, at least by my, my view, are people, right? So people build them, people use them, people provide the data that even if you are using machine learning to improve, make them more personalized, it's still built on people. And so understanding that and explicitly thinking of that, that through is, is important for making these things work. Um, and we're able to nevertheless uh, you know, automate from this foundation. So I have one last slide, which I think is a fun, it's just a pointer to some prior work I, I did with um, some colleagues at the um, University of Rochester Medical Center. Um, so oftentimes, I get this response in the crowdsourcing domain of, um, oh sure, you can recruit those people off of Mechanical Turk to, res to, to be part of your system to answer questions for people, but they just have unlimited time. This is nothing like medical doctors. There's no way you could get medical doctors to do this sort of thing. Turns out, everybody has those spare seconds, minutes of time, waiting in line for coffee. Maybe you're just like really interested in something. Maybe you want to procrastinate because you're, you don't want to write up the notes from your, your really long uh, uh, patient consult, whatever it is. Um, people will participate. And so we did this study um, where we had real uh, physicians answering questions from other physicians um, in sort of this text messaging type of way. We had this app that supported it. There's a web-based client there, all this, th all this stuff. Um, but they wanted to help. They did help. It was amazing. It kind of disproved this idea that doctors are too busy to be crowd workers. Um, anyway, pretty interesting. Okay, so um, that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jeff. So um, our last uh, panelist speaker uh, is Jeremy Gutman, uh, and he comes to us not from the health plan provider or the academic world, but from the real world of business, where he's you know, got products and solutions. He's the CEO of BioMotivate, and he's going to talk about technology and the human connection to, for addiction. So off you go. All right, hi everybody, I'm Jeremy Gutman. Uh, as John said, I'm the CEO of a company called BioMotivate, which is very new, uh, and I've been exploring this space for about a year and a half now. Uh, so this is Gary Fisher, Jr. Uh, about one year ago, uh, on November 2nd, 2017, Gary was featured in a Post-Gazette article with uh, interviews, videos, uh, and, and quotes, uh, because they were doing an article about the opioid crisis in a neighborhood in Pittsburgh, and Gary had overdosed 14 times before and was revived 14 times. Um, and he, he, he lived in the hilltop neighborhood above the south side. Um, and Gary, despite his history, was very optimistic. He thought he would own a, uh, an auto mechanic uh, 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 business. And he was happy that his story was being shared with the world so that it could inspire and inform others. But uh, about a month after the article came out, unfortunately, uh, Gary died of a heroin overdose when he locked himself in a bathroom. Um, this is his aunt at an event just a couple weeks ago at the uh, International Overdose Awareness Day in downtown Pittsburgh. Uh, at this event, um, a church bell rang 735 times to represent the number of people in Allegheny County who died from overdoses just in 2017, including Gary. There were over 5,000 people in Pennsylvania who died from overdoses uh, last year, and over 72,000 people across the country. The opioid epidemic is the deadliest epidemic in United States history. Car crashes used to be the leading cause of accidental death in the United States, but now it's uh, overdoses. Life expectancy in the United States has declined for the past two years, which has not happened for many decades, and many people attribute it to opioid overdoses. In this talk, I'm going to give you a little bit more information about the opioid crisis and about uh, uh, addiction and understanding addiction. Uh, then I'm going to talk about some technology solutions that are being done now in this space, 
and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some things I've been thinking about uh, for potential uh, new ideas with my new company. So some people get confused about opioids. Um, there's opiates and there's opium. So the way to understand that is opioids is now kind of a broad term, and underneath it there are opiates, which come from, uh, from natural sources uh, from the opium poppy, uh, and that includes things like uh, heroin and morphine. And then there are uh, synthetic uh, opioids uh, aside from that, and those include oxycontin, uh, Vicodin, uh, and methadone, uh, and also uh, fentanyl, which we'll get to in a second. So uh, Gary ended up getting hooked on heroin when he tried what he thought was cocaine, and it was heroin, and he loved it, and he got a great high, and he got hooked. A lot of people try opioids for the first time in pill form, uh, and often they get it from someone they know or uh, illegally, um, and, and that's usually one story is they're just kind of adventurous and young, and another story you often hear is that it's prescribed by a physician, uh, they get addicted to a prescription opioid, they can't get as much as they want, then they go on the street, it's $80 a pill for, uh, for, a, for a pain pill, but it's $10 for heroin, so they switch to heroin, um, and now uh, heroin is more deadly than it used to be, so that's why a lot of people who started with surgery are now ending up overdosing. Um, and this, the, I have a couple quotes from Gary from the article. So fentanyl is now being uh, put into heroin. Um, it's more powerful. It has a shorter high, but it's a new trend which is responsible primarily for why so many people are now dying. There's not a lot of functional heroin addicts anymore. Um, and this is a good example of it. Uh, fentanyl, just very small amounts of it are very deadly. Uh, and then there's an elephant tranquilizer, which there are reports about, which is even more deadly and, and dangerous even for first responders. Um, so another thing to understand about addiction uh, is uh, when people have it, they have craving obsession states. Uh, the academic literature calls it craving, but I call it craving obsession because uh, when you talk to people who struggle with it, it's these constant messages, trying to convince them about it. They talk about it as their addiction is trying to, 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 to get the better of them. They, they talk about it as separate from themselves. Um, and Gary's saying he, he, ha he couldn't figure out what to do about it, um, uh, which, which is, I think, part of the, the solutions here. Also, the relapse rates are sky high. It really overtakes people's minds when they get fully addicted, and it becomes the only priority in their life. They will destroy everything. They'll steal from anybody. All they want to do is get high. If they overdose and end up in the hospital, they'll call their dealer to the hospital, and then they'll go in the bathroom, and then they'll overdose again the minute they get out of the bed. It's really shocking to see this kind of behavior, um, and it makes people question about uh, uh, how much people can control it. Um, another problem with addiction is the stigma related to it. People don't want to admit that they have it. There's a societal perception that it's a moral failing. Uh, only about 10% of people who need treatment get it, so there's a lot to improve on that front. Um, it is improving, though. People are now seeing addiction as a chronic disease, like diabetes, um, that it's not your fault, um, and that's helping to get people more aware and more in treatment and, and more support. Um, in my research, I see addiction as a disease of emotions beyond just uh, treating it like diabetes. Um, People use uh, drugs to cope with their feelings, to cope with stress. They say that they, it helps them so they don't have to feel anything. Uh, you hear that all the time from people, and that relates to other addictions as well, but, um, but opioid uh, addiction in particular. Um, and uh, also, uh, this is another quote from Gary. This uh, touches on how there's a lot of overlap with mental illness and addiction that uh, a lot of people don't focus on. They don't get the right treatment for the right things. Um, Two other things to know about uh, this space uh, are that there's a, a, a medication-assisted treatment, MAT, is now becoming more popular, it's more evidence-based, there's studies to support it. There's not a lot of long-term studies on it, uh, but it's, it, it really levels people out to give them the, the space to be able to work on the other things they need to do in their life. Um, two of them are kind of replacements for opioids, and this third one, Vivitrol, is an injection that blunts the effects of heroin for an entire month. It also works for alcohol, um, and that helps people, but it's expensive. But even if insurance covers it, people get one shot, two shots, and they don't show up to get their third shot because they want the choice to use again. 
So uh, there really is, it's more like, and as you can see, behavioral therapy is a part of MAT for that reason. It's medication assisted therapy. It's not just medication. It's not a silver bullet. On the other end of the spectrum, there's Narcotics Anonymous, 12 step programs. Um, if you're not familiar, it's a somewhat uh, spiritual, self motivated program. People meet like in, in churches uh, once a week. It's like a big brother, big sister type of program. You get these key tags for how clean you are. And people who stick with it do very well um, if they have all the support in place. Um, but a lot, it's, it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't work for a lot of people who try it, especially young people aren't as drawn, as drawn to it anymore. So I think there's, that's something to focus on for how you can uh, have an adjunct to, to the, the, the benefits there. Also, I wanted to mention, um, I read an article of the former CEO of Twitter uh, started a company for weight loss or, 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 or some kind of athletic performance, and they shut it down because they realized the only way to really make a difference was to have in-person meetings and to have tangible goals that the group was working towards. And they said they couldn't find a way to monetize that, so they're shutting their company down. But when I read that, that sounded like Narcotics Anonymous because they have all these meetings, they have these key tags, they have these goals. So that was just an interesting thing I saw. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about some of the solutions that are out there. I also want to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence. I think the benefits of it are that it can see patterns that humans can't see. It can automate things that humans can't do. Um, it's particularly good with medical imaging these days. Google uh, last year uh, determined that if they take uh, like a million diabetic retinopathy scans and they know which ones uh, are where someone doesn't have the condition and, when we're, and they have some where people do and they feed that to an AI system, it's more accurate at diagnosing it than ophthalmologists. And then the next year, which uh, I found surprising, they came out and said, not only can we detect diabetic retinopathy accurately, but we can detect cardiovascular risk and age and gender from, a, from an image of the back of somebody's eye. And so uh, AI, I think this is where I, AI works best. Um, there, are, there are many limitations to it uh, based on data and other things, but for image processing where you have a label, you know what's a disease and what's not, that's the best use of that kind of technology. Uh, what makes it better is more data for those types of purposes and good data. Um, IBM Watson did a project in Texas um, where they were trying to do clinical decision support using AI and it just wasn't that informative because the data they were working with from the EHR systems wasn't helpful enough and then they abandoned the project. So uh, people are trying in the field, but um, the, they're learning where it works best and what you need to do to make it work in other, other types of areas. Um, there was a couple uh, wearables I wanted to point out also in when we're talking about technology and health and behavior. Google has this cool project called uh, Baseline. Uh, they have this study watch they invented um, that people wear all the time and uh, connect it to this thing which sends the data over a wireless connection and they have this pod in their bed that detects everything seamlessly. And in order to know whether something's improving, you need to know uh, what data is on, at the baseline. And so they have 10,000 people they're planning to uh, put into this study. And they're also pioneering ways to show people their own da data as they are participants. Um, so that's worth looking up. Um, this whoop band uh, is a, also relates to seamlessness of devices. Instead of having to charge a device, you have a little pod you charge in the wall, and then you stick it on your, uh, your, your, your band for about an hour, and then you take it off, and it's good for another two days. So there's a lot of uh, people talk about, oh, if you get somebody to wear a wearable, are they going to wear it all the time? So there's some interesting ideas in that space. This is used by a lot of pro athletes and Michael Phelps and, and NHL players. And that's raising issues with who owns the data if a, if a sports team is, is monitoring their players. Um, another interesting wearable, the Spire Tag, they just got some funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. You glue it into your underwear, you get like 10 of them, um, and you'd never have to charge it lasts a year and a half, and it detects respiration and other things. I wonder how accurately it does detect things and how often, because if the battery's lasting a year and a half, but that's what they're working on. Um, the Apple Watch just got cleared for two apps, not the watch itself. They don't want the watch uh, cleared by the FDA, but now they're doing some heart, heart rate studies with the Apple Watch. Um, and there's a couple apps now I'm gonna go through related to addiction. Um, Another company just got FDA approval for an app. Um, that's the first uh, smartphone app that's ever been approved by the FDA. Uh, it helps with addiction. 
Um, it's based on cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, it's from a company called Pair Therapeutics. They have not gotten their, uh, their app for opioids approved yet, interestingly. So it seemed easier for other types of addictions than opioids to get that approved. Uh, this company out of the University of Wisconsin, um, Geofences is what it's called, where you say, oh, my problem bars are here, and then when you go near the problem bars, it'll, it'll put an alert on your device. Uh, this company, SoberGrid, it's like Facebook for people in recovery. Uh, if you have a burning desire, you post it, and everybody sends you supportive messages. It shows you who's nearby. Um, this company, Aware Recovery Care, is beyond just an app, and I think they're, they're one of the people who are, do, who are really smart about what they're doing. They have a whole care team. Um, it's a one-year program. You stay at home. You don't separate yourself and go to a treatment center. And they have this SoberLink device for alcohol where you breathe into it. It does facial recognition, and if you fail it, it sends a notification to all the people in your network. So there's a lot of people working in this space figuring things out. Um, on the research side, there's some researchers using wearables to detect use of cocaine and heroin. There's researchers using wearable devices uh, to detect uh, uh, correlates with craving states that people self-report, and they're trying to uh, create predictive models with that. Um, if you want any of that uh, research uh, citations, you can email me about it, but there's, there's a, a lot of work in that space. Some people are trying to use EHR data and claims data to predict whether someone's becoming addicted in the first place. Um, so there's, there's a, lot, a lot around there. So for future use, um, NIDA says that uh, tools to intervene are extremely limited right now. Um, and there was a recent article by some NIDA researchers saying that ecological mobilier and testament self-reports and physiological information have potential to predict and prevent stress and drug craving. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, that's one of the spaces I've looked into about uh, gathering information and detecting uh, certain behaviors to predict relapses or to predict any kind of escalation of problem behaviors. It can be expanded to many other types of behaviors as well. Um, the key question is what factors do you gather? Is a Fitbit and a self-report enough? Do you need to gather galvanic skin response stress measures? Um, what's the crucial combination that matters? That remains to be seen, but there's people doing different studies on that. Um, one company I wanted to point out is called Ginger IO. They were trying to just use smartphone usage data to detect uh, behavioral health issues but they couldn't sell their platform to hospitals, uh, which was their original plan. So now they are a uh, online uh, behavioral health support system that also uses their analytics on the side for some things. So they pivoted away from just predicting, and now they're offering a version of treatment as well. Um, some of the key concepts, I think, to keep in mind in this space are positive versus negative encouragement. There's a device called the Pavlock. It's like Pavlog's dogs. It shocks you for behavior change. Um, and so it works for some things, but I think for more complicated conditions, you probably need a combination of positive and negative encouragement, but that, there needs to be more research on that. Um, accountability is key. Um, people say that all the time. They need consequences to respond to. Um, tolerability, if you were Microsoft Word a long time ago, it said, hey, looks like you're writing a letter. So, there's an issue of saying, hey, it looks like you might be in a craving state. What do you want to do about it? And then people might be like, what the heck is this? Like, don't tell me what to do, and then they'll stop. So there, that needs to be kept in mind as well. Um, and the human connection. Um, a lot of technology, I think, is used to bring people together, to get them to resources, and to address their underlying emotional uh, issues. And so I think like, an app alone is not going to solve a lot of these behavior change issues. Um, it's really going to be helping to facilitate it in ways that we've never been able to do before and using the technology we have available and the technology in the future. So um, last thing is just uh, the lyrics from uh, Michael Jackson's song, The Man in the Mirror. I, think, I thought this was kind of poignant about behavior change. Um, people need to be self-motivated to change their behavior, but they also need help to become self-motivated. So I think people need internal and external motivation to be able to real, make a real change in their lives. Um, and so if you're interested in exploring any of this, um, my company's looking into this space. Um, we, we're looking for interns, collaborators. Um, so send me an email or come talk to me if you're interested in, in this area and let's see what kind of tools we can come up with. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So let me uh, 
move on to a blank screen. So um, I could talk to these folks for an hour and have a great time, and I could think of questions, but I, I'm hoping there's a way that we can take questions from you uh, for our panel. I don't know if there's a microphone available, or if not, if you'd like to stand up and state a question. It's probably best if you state it and then I restate it here so it's recorded. Um, does anybody have something they want to start with with our panelists? If not, one of the questions I wanted to, oh, there we go. Check, check. Oh, wait, actually, there's a microphone coming over. If you just wait, we'll get you mic'd up. So my question is, my question is for the first speaker. Um, with regard to implementation of AI, I'm wondering about any thoughts you have about standards um, that might be created as I've been tracking AI's use in medicine. I've noticed that there are some barriers to implementation having to do with getting the expertise, as you were talking about, into the training aspect of the AI. Primarily, I think, because there might be some hesitancy on the part of clinicians and experts in being willing to train this, wondering about how the AI will eventually be implemented. So I'm wondering about sort of governing, governing bodies and standards and what you think should be done currently to uh, shape the development of AI. I think that was for you, speaker, Ellen. Yeah. <laughs> you're not asking me, right, Nicole? You're asking. Right. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, Ellen. <laughs> yeah. it's okay. This is on, right? Can you hear me? Um, I would, I guess I would, I'm not sure I'm an amazing person to ask this, but I, I feel like it's very early, right? Um, and I think that we don't yet know what we would want to create, how all that should work. Um, and I think that means there's two sides. One is I don't think we should rush into things, right? So we don't, I don't think we should believe every, every news release, for instance, that comes out that says that, you know, AI is, is, um, you know, better than humans at X because most of the time that's been proven to be false. Um, at the same time, I think that we should be actively exploring this and figuring out if we did have standards or governing bodies, what that should be, what those should be, what they should be tasked with. Um, I think that especially in this domain, it's, it's super important that we don't, we don't release things that we don't understand, that we don't have a good sense of how they work when they fail, you know, uh, it's really easy to report an accuracy number and say, oh, look, it's better than humans, for instance, but if, you know, those 2% of the times that it fails, it fails in a really bad way or a way that humans didn't fail or other things, then that, that seems really worrisome. Um, but yeah, I don't know. So that's, a, that's not an answer. But I think the, I think, I guess the point is I would be hesitant to standardize things before we know what will work. At the same time, there are risks, and I think we should be fully cognizant of those risks and how we can deploy things and study things without, without harming. Uh, Charles. No, actually, there's a mic here. Let's use that, and then I think it'll be recorded for posterity. <laughs> um, so I just had a question about how you respond to the chat bot specifically, and this is open for anybody. Because um, it seems like with, and I believe the Odyssey, it has a set responses, so you could say, you know, do you want to talk more? And it says yes, no, maybe. And then you select versus. Sounds like Jeff, with your chat bot, you essentially have open text and you're asking the machine to interpret that open text. And obviously, you know, as we chat with our friends, we use open text and expect that interpretation. And I'm just wondering, clearly it's easier to, for the machine to understand if you have a response set, but how do people respond to that and in which direction are things going? Is it better to have a set response or do we really want to try to get to this kind of more open text interpretation? Okay, I can go, um, I can go first. Is this on? It should be. I think I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. I can talk pretty loud. Even. Oh, okay. that sounds like it's on. Um, so I think that's a, that's a challenging question. Are set response options always um, allowed for sort of three broad categories, which were as you kind of alluded to, sort of, you know, agreement or, you know, consistency, a disagreement, or, you know, I need more information, I'm not sure, I'm not willing to make a call, which we felt like covered a lot of bases. I, I, and I, you know, will be looking at the frequency with which those different responses were selected to help us understand if we were adequately covering what most, you know, people would want to respond with. 
But I think it gets back to this question about, you know, there's such a resource differential, and maybe that won't be the case forever, but there is at least now, right, a pretty significant resource differential between having something that can use natural language processing to, um, to sort of drive the response of the chatbot uh, versus something that's kind of very pre-programmed. And the question that I keep trying to think about in, in health, I don't know if this would apply to the use of chatbots in other contexts, is whether that re resource differential is worth it, meaning, you know, is it so much better for uh, the impact or the experience even, both, the, the experience and the impact of the solution, which are gonna be related, to, to go sort of very high tech, you know, natural language processing, some amount of AI? Or is it good enough to, uh, to do something like what we've done in Odyssey. I don't know, and again, I'm, I'm really looking for, if there are data that people are aware of that have tested that, you know, I don't, we're not positioned to test it within Odyssey, um, but I'm, I'm, we're looking for those data, and I'm super interested in that question. So, I, I, but I think that's the important, one of the important questions to ask. And I think there's like a couple thousand people working on Amazon Alexa to come up with all the responses they have, so there's a lot of manpower there right now. It's not really, a, a true AI at its core. I mean, I guess if you look at this from a research perspective, there are kind of three-ish approaches that people take. So there's kind of the classic task-oriented dialogue system, which is much more constrained, where essentially you design beforehand what the dialogue tree looks like, you know, where you can get from where. Um, and you can always try to expand it, you can make it slightly more robust of things. But that's, that's kind of where we're at with a lot of these things, where you have some notion of where you're trying to lead the conversation, what are you trying to accomplish. The system kind of goes from state to state to figure out, well, you know, I, I'm, I know this about the user so far, I want to know these things, here's how I can ask it. And if you go out beyond those, bond, those bounds, then it doesn't work. There's, now a lot of people are working on these chatterbots, and that's kind of this open domain. But there's no real sense of a task, right? It's really hard to actually accomplish something. It's kind of like, the deep learning version of Eliza, right? Like where it's just kind of meaning, you can have meaningless conversations for a long time, but they're not always consistent with each other, they don't really accomplish anything. Uh, and then as mentioned, there's kind of these speech controlled devices, which, you know, really aren't even conversation. They're single turn generally, right? You can say, you know, Alexa, what's the weather? And then Alexa tells you the weather, but there's no like building up of context or having a real back and forth multi-turn conversation. All of those things are being worked on and they probably, are more or less useful in different domains, right? So um, sometimes you probably can get by with just a dialogue system, right? And maybe that's actually what you want. Other times, you know, maybe you need that richer, real conversation. If I can just add one thing to that. So two, two sort of constructs that we've used to guide some decision making around this are, and which I think the, the more obvious one is complexity. So as the complexity of the, the content or the conversation goes up, you know, the ability to cap, it's one of our reasons sometimes we defaulted to long form because we felt like we can't possibly, you know, reliably anticipate the majority of what the questions or responses to this content might be. We don't want to try to do that with the chatbot, so this is going to be a long form piece of content. So complexity matters. But the other piece that matters, particularly, I guess not just in health, but what we've thought about in the context of health, is the risk of failure. So, you know, when we think about some automated response, you know, the risk of failure for the, for the person's experience, if we get it wrong when you tell us your member ID using a keypad, right, is I feel like a lower risk than a risk of failure if you're like telling us about your goals or your hopes or your ambitions around your health and we get a response to that wrong, like, now we're not just annoying, we're also like insensitive and a jerk. You know, so I feel like it matters as you get, and usually there's a relationship between them. You know, the more complex interactions I think have a higher risk of failure because we're just approximating a relational interaction, but that can turn on a dime. And as soon as you get it wrong, you know, it's worse than having never promoted the relational interaction at all, I think. You know, you can, so the risk of failure is important too. Go ahead. Uh, hi, this question is for Alan. Um, Alan, have, has Health Plan looked at the data of use of RSC and its impact on outcomes? So drug adherence, uh, improvement in their A1Cs, or blood pressure control? So no, we, we have not yet looked at Odyssey 
impact on some of those biometric outcomes. We're very interested in deploying it in sort of focused cases for individuals living with chronic conditions where some of the lifestyle behaviors that are targeted um, would be very relevant, so, you know, weight loss for, we will be doing a pilot of Odyssey, our weight loss management um, program on Odyssey for individuals uh, who are identified as being at risk for diabetes in, in a test of a DPP program um, in 2019. Um, but we haven't done that yet, but we have probably still, uh, somebody can keep me honest on this, I think we have less than 200 member users right now on the Odyssey platform, so we've, we're pretty early in implementation, but we, and we're gathering data on those users on like primary outcomes associated with the program, so if they're in weight loss, did they lose weight, if they're in nutrition, did they change their eating habits, et cetera. But, um, but really looking for good clinical use cases for deployment and for anyone here that would be interested in talking with us about the opportunity to use Odyssey in your patient population, we're very interested in making those relationships. No, I hadn't. I hadn't heard of them. Thank you. Let's see, our next question is over here. I think. Uh, just a congratulations again to Bruce for an excellent conference, as always. And a question I have for you is that this space is called the para EHR space or the paranormal. You know, someone who works for the health plan but's also a surgeon. So much of clinical care flows through the EHRs. I'm not saying it has to broker clinical decision making, but it does a lot of it. And the work we do with remote monitoring, you know, you with Ellen and obviously Matt and Brian and others that are here, it's a giant interoperability issue. And at the American Telemedicine Association, we're really looking at the interoperability of these systems. You know, semantic interoperability is a huge lift. But how do we get this data back to the front lines of primary care, you know, channeling Diane right now? How do we get it back to the front lines of medicine and health and wellness? Um, it's a very interesting challenge, and it's more of a comment than a, uh, than a question. Um, and let's all do this on Twitter, too. It's a lot of good activity on Twitter right now. <laughs> but the interoperability of these systems is such a big issue. And you hear about what you commented about IBM Watson. I mean, that's what really brought it down. They couldn't get access to the data. They're looking at narrow networks, and it's uh, hard to get it all together. Thank you. So I think that it's probably not appropriate to call it the final frontier, but acutely it feels like the final frontier right now. You know, we, and, and I don't know that... You know, it's, it's, it's been such an interesting sort of five to ten years. We have created the opportunity for that kind of interoperability, and maybe it isn't reasonable to expect that we could have solved for that before we built the tools that even give us the opportunity, but it's such a big challenge. I know Amber Blackwood on my team is leading a lot of thinking and, and just kind of infrastructure building at the health plan on that with others across uh, the organization and IT and analytics and marketing and clinical. It's such an enormous problem. Sometimes it feels like handwriting the data and delivering it, delivering it via carrier pigeon might be like as reasonable as <laughs> trying to like solve for it technologically. Um, but it really, I think for the, for the near term is kind of the final frontier and where we have to, where we have to go because the clinical integration uh, and, and the, the, the use of those data in the context of clinical care and what the information requirements, not the data requirements, you know, the information, data aren't information until you do something. And then even information is not actionable until you do something again. And putting those data, translating those data into information and making that information actionable either in how you translate it or where you put it um, in, within the confines of our existing workflows, uh, I think is really where we, now we have, a, there are so many tools, right? We should be probably shifting most of our time and attention to those questions. And I know a lot of people are. Oh. Right, <clears throat> thank you. Um, Jeremy, uh, your uh, presentation uh, reminded me that the other major advance we've had is in imaging of the brain. So using PET scans and other things, what we know is that the craving and addiction centers and pathways are identical between the opioids, casein and cheese, by the way, um, some of the positive feedback we get when we're in a family setting and people give us approval, alcohol, et cetera. So the good news is if I'm building sensors, the pathway should be relatively common for sensing when that hits. What we've not characterized well is what Vic Sketcher, his company is at the University of Michigan called Juul, unfortunate name, J-U-U-L. He <laughs> named it after his daughter, not the uh, vaping device. <laughs> but what we've not captured, and I'm not sure we can capture at all, 
in AI, bots, chats, whatever, is purpose. What really gets us all going is the purpose that Ellen or Mike or Jeremy or Steven has and refreshing that continually as that morphs over time. And I, between the physiologic pathways that are in common for all of these endpoints, and by the way, nobody's gonna get their Suboxone certificate. So, so I am all for what you're ever, Jeremy, doctors are going the other way. This is a national number one cause of death in certain age groups. And so there's an urgency about what you're talking about, but I don't think we've got the solutions yet, or even at the federal level. So some reactions to that, but specifically pathways and purpose. Because at the macro level, that's what we're creeping up on, but I'm not sure we're at the purpose point, and I don't think we're accelerating fast enough on the commonalities of pathways for addiction. Yeah, so I think, um, I think this relates to how like physiology alone, or even brain, uh, brain waves alone, um, might not be enough information. I think it goes back to the crucial combination of factors. So it, it's possible uh, for, with some level of accuracy that if you know how many texts somebody is sending and if their location patterns change and if their sleep patterns change and if they're sweating differently and their physiology changes, it's possible that that would be enough separate information to differentiate uh, their intentions uh, that you might not be able to get from just one or two of those factors. There's also um, something that uh, uh, I've explored a little bit is adding in uh, like support network reports. Um, so the people around you might know your intentions, even if the, everything tracking you might not. But if you could take in, like if people think you're in a risk state and they like text that to a phone number and that gets combined with all the other tracking information, that also has the potential to make it more accurate. So I think it just has to do with finding the, uh, all the factors that can be tracked um, and putting them together, and that would make it more accurate. Okay, I think we've got time for maybe one more question here, and then I'm going to give each panelist kind of a, a parting shot minute or so. So go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you all for your presentation. I've um, found it very um, helpful. Um, as a person who's not very familiar with this line of work, but who's very interested, one of the things that comes to mind for me is cost. And, and, and all of this sounds very expensive, right? And as a postdoc, uh, postdoctoral researcher, right, I don't have a lot of money. So I, I have a sort of a two-part question. Um, one of them is sort of what are um, ideas that you all have about, or I'm sorry, what information do you have about um, how AI or chatbots and things like that are being made more accessible to people who may not have a lot of money like a UPMC or Apple or something like that? And then the second part of that question is, what suggestions might you all have for making something like this affordable or at least attainable for use um, for someone like myself who's, who's interested in doing some of this kind of research? It's a great question. Um, I think that, I think the way, the reason why people pursue this sort of research is that I think they, they start from this assumption that the alternative is human to human interaction and that's very expensive and so if we can automate it, it's cheaper. Obviously that's not always true. There's not always that human to human interaction. Um, and so one of the things though I think we might be looking at is um, reducing the cost of something that approximates human to human interaction um, and if you look at where chatbots and things are, are really being actively deployed, and probably where some people may not even know they're being deployed is in you know, customer care centers, right? So if you chat to T-Mobile or Delta or whoever, um, you are talking to a person who's amplified by something like the technologies that we're talking about here, right? Where the single agent may have 20 different um, conversations going on at the same time. That might be why sometimes the conversations are really weird and you get these sort of clearly pre-scripted answers, right? And so maybe the question to ask is, if we could approximate something like human-to-human -human conversation, but with the caveat that it's actually 1 20th of a human that you're really getting, is that something we want in particular domains? Um, I think there's also, very related to your question, uh, you know, as something comes up in uh, education, for instance, where I, I, I have seen reports that uh, many more children in schools are learning from technology, by technology. Turns out that's not as likely to happen if you are at a wealthy school district than at a lower income school district. Are we comfortable with, say, healthcare 
going down the same road where if you can afford it, you get to talk to an actual doctor. <laughs> if you can't afford it, you get to talk to a chatbot or maybe a 120th of a doctor, chatbot, amplified doctor representative. Lots of interesting questions. So I would add that um, I think a remarkable amount can be done with a budget of between twenty-five dollars and $50,000, which is usually kind of the going rate for you know, some, some budget on top of different grants, and, you know, including like the Pitt Innovation Challenge. There, you know, um, it's amazing what can be done with that amount of money, and I'd be happy to talk with you how I used that amount of money to do some things. I would talk to Sherry because I think a lot can be done with existing social media platforms. Um, and then finding partners. So, you know, if, if somebody's already built the functionality and you just want to swap out different content, there's lots of complexities around forming those collaborations, but they're not insurmountable. I'd be happy to talk with you. I'm sure other folks would too. But I think those three things in combination can, can uh, you can do quite a lot even with a little bit of money. You can do more with a lot of money, but you can do quite a lot with a little bit of money. Oh, and I think I misunderstood the question. Check out Dialogflow. It's a really nice platform for building, a, building out chatbots. Um, Okay, I think uh, we're kind of over time. I see Bruce here, so let's thank the panelists, and then I'll turn it over to Bruce. <laughs>